Well, apparently, my um, comments about the river made a greater impact than I thought. Uh, the only thing, Paul, you need to be careful when you lead that song. Uh, don't do, as I heard it told of uh, one congregation where the preacher had been preaching against alcohol, and he said, what we ought to do is just gather it all up and throw it in the river. And then they stood up and sung, shall we gather at the river? <laughs> We need to be sure our songs fit the occasion. Uh, isn't he doing a great job leading singing? Thank you so much for, for that. I'm glad to be back with you this evening and uh, appreciate your uh, very favorable response to uh, this um, cornbread preaching and uh, your good attention, and I, I appreciate that very, very much. It means a lot to me. Now, I want to know if you have your Bibles. If you do, would you hold them up? Get them up high. Back, wait, good. Now these girls up, well, there you go. I'll tell you, what now? I didn't tell you to put them down. Hold them up. All right, good. Okay, good, good. I'll take um, iPhones and iPads and I had a guy one time hold up a laptop, you know, for me. We'll, we'll, as long as it's the Bible, right? We'll take whatever form of uh, communication means uh, uh, that's uh, being utilized. All right, so bring your Bibles. And I appreciate you, uh, you having those. Now, speaking of the river, I want to begin tonight uh, with an illustration that has to do with fishing. Now, I learned today that Paul really likes to fish. Others of you may like to fish. His uh, wife, Gail, asked me, uh, did I fish? And I said, well, I remember distinctly the last time I went fishing. It was January the 1st, 1972. So what does that tell you? I was trying to set up a Bible study with a neighbor of mine, and he liked to fish, and so I was trying to, uh, Wayne, establish that relationship and so forth, and it was sleeting and snowing, and I said, I want to go to the house. <laughs> and um, I didn't get to Bible study either, <laughs> but at any rate, uh, sometimes you're able to achieve those goals, and sometimes you're not. All right, here's my illustration. Uh, there are some men who like to um, get together and talk about fishing at the local country store. You know, in some communities, there's, uh, there's a store. I met uh, tonight Richard uh, Perry. Where'd you land, Richard? Um, somewhere. There he is back there. And Richard informed me that his dad used to preach at the Beach Hill uh, Church of Christ on Highway 4 West Ripley, Mississippi. And I used to work there as well in the, in the uh, 70s. And he remembers fondly, as I do, the little country store where the men would gather and uh, um, they tell lies, among other things, all right? Some of them have to do with fishing. So uh, some men were talking about fishing one day, and one of them said, well, what we ought to do is have a workshop on fishing and just invite some men to come in, and, and some can talk about the, uh, the conditions under which you ought to fish, and others can talk about some other aspect of fishing. And so they, they pulled it together, and they invited people from far and wide, and lo and behold, one young man came who had never been fishing, and he attended the majority of the lectures. And having attended the uh, various lessons, he went home and he went fishing. And guess what happened? He caught a fish. That happens sometimes, doesn't it? And when the workshop director and his committee heard about it, they were just, you know, carried away because of the success of this young man who had come to the workshop and had left and actually had gone fishing and caught a fish. And so they said, we ought to have him next year as the keynote speaker. And so they invited him in as the keynote speaker. And uh, he had mounted his fish, and they wanted him to bring his fish. So he came the next year, and uh, he brought his fish, and he gave a lesson that was just, just, uh, in, uh, just incredible. It was thrilling, you know, to hear about his fishing experience. He talked about when he was fishing, what time uh, he, of the day he was fishing. He talked about where he was fishing, what kind of fish he was fishing for, how deep he was fishing, the kind of bait he used, and so forth and so on. And so others heard about it, and they said, we want him to come to our community and tell about his fishing experience. And others heard, and they said, we want him to come to our community, and so forth and so on. And you know what happened? He never, ever caught another fish. He spent the rest of his days carrying his fish around and telling how he caught that fish. 
Now, here's my point. Tonight, we want to talk about fishing. But we want to leave here and what? Hello? We want to leave here and fish. All right. Very, very good. A little slow, but you, you came in there. All right. Now, now when we start talking about uh, church growth, when we start talking about evangelism and some things like this, it's interesting to me how some congregations go about, uh, go about a study of this subject. Richard said they're studying personal evangelism where he is. It's interesting to me, Richard, how some go about um, uh, talking about this. Frequently what I hear is elders will say something like this. Well, next year our theme is going to be evangelism or maybe two years from now. And so they'll appoint a committee to study about evangelism. And they will allocate a large portion of the budget toward uh, um, uh, the study of evangelism and they encourage these committee members to go here and there, far and wide, to uh, explore what other people are doing by way of evangelism. And then they say, now we want you to spend six months doing this and then come back and give us a report. And so they do that. And they come back and they give the elders the report. And the elders say, well, we're going to study it for about three months or so. And we'll tweak it and refine it and so forth. And then we'll present it to the congregation, you know, for them to look at. And we'll give them three months or so, you know, to examine it. A year's gone by and we hadn't caught a fish yet. What do you think? You see what I'm saying? I want to suggest tonight some very fundamental things from Scripture that we can all do that will help us win souls for Christ. And brethren, let me tell you something. This is not complicated. You don't have to have a string of degrees to figure this out. It is not rocket science. These principles come from Holy Scripture. And they are principles that were utilized by the Lord's people a long, long time ago. And I am convinced that they are still applicable today. The early church was very successful in evangelism. Now let me talk to you just briefly about how successful they were. Tacitus, a Roman historian, spoke of the church as an immense multitude. Now, here's a, here's a secular historian who paid attention to God's people. And Suetonius, another historian, spoke of the church as a dangerous sect. Now, they weren't a sect. A sect refers to a group of dissenters who have pulled off from some orthodox group holding to some belief um, or practice. And so it was believed that the early church pulled off of Judaism, and that's the way they were perceived. But the point is this. They... Uh, were paid attention to, you know, by historians. This thing is bothering me. Is it, is it on there right, Wayne? Are we there? Is that okay? All right. Now, here's my point. The early church had a profound impact on the world of its day. So much so that, that secular writers gave attention to them. Is everybody with me now? And so, I think that's very, very important. The church was very, uh, if you will, militant. Now, I do not mean militant in the sense of attacking those in positions of authority and burning buildings and starting riots and things like that. But I mean that they were aggressive. They recognized themselves as God's army. They recognized that they had a captain of their salvation. They recognized that they had a mission. The early church was profoundly uh, significant in those respects. Just look at a few verses of Scripture that testify to this point. For example, in Acts 2.41, Then they that glad to receive the word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to the church. In verse 47, Praising God and having favor with all the people, the Lord added to the church daily. In Acts 4 and 4, the number of the male members, the Greek indicates, the male members was about 5,000. In Acts 5, 42, daily in the temple and in every house, they ceased not to preach and teach Jesus. In Acts 6 and 7, the word of God increased. The number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient unto the faith. And so here are just a few passages that tell of the growth of the Lord's church. Now, here's my question. What were some of the things that they did that enabled them to grow? And uh, 
are some of these things we can, uh, some of these things that they did, are they things that we can do that will enable us to continue to grow today? What do you think? All right, so here, here's what I got to suggest to you. Number one, the early church grew because, among other things, they stood for something. They stood for something. I read a book, Wayne, back in the 70s, authored by a man by the name of Dean Kelly, not a member of the church, but the title of the book was, was this, Why Conservative Churches Grow. And among other things, he said that conservative churches grow because they are exclusive and uncompromising. You see, that just goes contrary to the, uh, to the uh, common belief today. You know, the common belief today is that, well, if we'll just uh, sort of lower the bar, or if we'll, um, you know, kind of, you know, make allowance for just about whatever, you know, someone wants to believe in practice, then that will ensure the growth of the church. But that's not the thesis of what this man was saying. Now, just think about it. Do conservative groups grow or not? What about the Muslims? Would you say they're very conservative? Most certainly. Are they growing? Go on the internet sometime and, and check out growth of the Muslims. See what's happened over in Europe. See what's happened in North Africa. You know, see what's happening farther you come you know, to the West. What I'm saying is this. Conservatism also involves growth. And the early church you know, grew because they stood for something. How does the old song go? If you don't stand for something, you'll what? Fall for everything. And so what I'm saying is this. The early Christians stood for something, they hated false ways, Psalms 119, 104. They preached the truth, they preached the truth in love, they preached the truth in spite of the fact that some people might not appreciate it. In Luke 6 and 26, our Lord said, Beware when all men speak well of you. Brethren, here's the long and short of it. We're not going to make everybody happy. Now, we might want to make people happy. We might want to, I mean, that's certainly my desire. We want to please people, but we simply cannot please everyone. Our Lord Jesus himself said, the world hates you because it hated me. You see, we don't think like the world. We don't have the desires of the world. We don't have the beliefs of the world. We do not have the values of the world. And so the world and, and Christians you know, have a lot not in common. The early church stood for something. They believed that God's people needed to be distinctive. Paul said it this way, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. And, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, saith the Lord Almighty. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness and the fear of God. That's 2 Corinthians 6, about 16 down through 7, 1. Now here's my point. God expects us to be different from the world. Amen? Isn't that right? He expects us to be different. The bar is high. I've had more than one person say that I had the bar sort of high in education. I think it ought to be high. Just think about it. When the bar is high, then that gives you something to aim, aim toward. You see, if you have the bar way down here, well, it's nothing to that. <laughs> you know, I can do that. But you see, if you have the bar high, that gives you something to strive for. And so God expects us to be different people. He does not want us to think like the world. He doesn't want us to talk like the world. He does not want us to have the attitude of the world. He does not want us to have the behavior that the world has. And so we expect God's people to be different. I'm not saying they ought to look weird or act weird or anything like that, but we're supposed to be different. Is that right? We're different people you know, than the world. We've been washed by the blood of Christ. You know, we're not in the domain of Satan. We're in the kingdom of God. Number two, I think the early church was successful in evangelism because they had a burning passion for souls. Now, they got this passion from the Lord Jesus Christ. In Luke 19 and 10, the Bible says, The Son of Man has come to seek and save that which is lost. Jesus came to do the will of the Father. John chapter 6 and verse 38. He said, my food is to, to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work, John 4 and 34. In John 9 and 4, he said, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is daytime. The night comes when no man can work. And so Jesus Christ came to seek and save lost people. He was passionate 
about that, wasn't he? That's so very clear in Scripture. I love John chapter 2 when he is at the temple. And do you remember that um, the temple was not being used properly? Now, <clears throat> the other gospel writers call attention to those in the temple precincts being robbers. John doesn't say anything about that. Jesus goes into the temple area. Actually, he's in the court of the Gentiles. And in the court of the Gentiles, you may not be aware of this, but in the court of the Gentiles, provision was made for the Gentiles to have a place to pray and to meditate. And in that area, they were selling, you know, all kinds of animals. So you had sheep and goat and birds and so forth and so on. And it upset our Lord Jesus so much that he said, don't turn my father's house into a house of merchandise. And he turned over the changers, the money changers tables and so forth. And then the disciples remembered, this is John 2, 17. The disciples remembered a scripture, the zeal of thine house has eaten me up. You see, Jesus got excited when it came to spiritual things. Well, he's our example, is he not? In 1 Peter 2, and 21, here and two were you call because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example. So Jesus got excited about spiritual things. We've got to have that same kind of commitment. We've got to stand for something. We've got to be uh, people who um, you know, give our very being you know, to that which belongs to God. Some years ago, <clears throat> Ms. Life and I, we're vacationing somewhere in another state. And uh, let me just say this. We had not planned like we should have. If you go on a vacation, be sure to make your plans as to what you're going to do on the Lord's Day. All right? So here we were on the Lord's Day, and we had not planned as we should have. So we wanted to worship. And uh, so we stopped at this place to worship. All right? So um, we pulled into this place. This kindly older gentleman met us at the uh, door and welcomed us, very friendly person, and at that time I was uh, teaching Bible at Freed Hardeman, and when I disclosed to him that fact, he said, well, you might want to come back to the next service. Now, this was 15 years ago, maybe, maybe 20, and I said, well, sir, why would that be? He said, well, this is the outreach service. I said, well, brother, I'm all about outreach. You know, I hadn't been all over this world preaching the gospel and leading campaigns and so forth and knocking doors and grading Bible correspondence courses and so forth and so on if I didn't believe in outreach. So we go in and we're sitting toward the back. You know how you do as a visitor. You don't go up and take a seat on the front row. We're sitting toward the back. And uh, Paul had this order of worship, <clears throat> uh, as some churches do, and they had the songs and, and the prayer and so forth, you know, listed on it. And one of the items was entitled, Share the Blessing. And I thought, Share the Blessing. And the first thought that came to my mind was, that's an old, old song. And so I was sitting there trying to get the tune of it, and I was apparently a bit louder than I should have been. And so I was to myself saying, Share, share the blessing, share, share. And I couldn't get the tune, and my wife punched me in the ribs, and she said, It's not a song, dummy. I didn't think that was very nice, <laughs> but at any rate, so now I can't wait to find out what share of the blessing is. You know, I'm getting my pen out here, and I got my order of worship, and so we had a prayer, and I checked that off, and I'm thinking, I've got four more things till I get to the share of the blessing. I check off the next song and so forth, and finally we get to share of the blessing. You know what share of the blessing was? The preacher's wife got up and did a solo and then led the church in singing. And then I thought, yep, that guy was right and I was wrong. <laughs> and, and I thought, wow, this is incredible, you know, that, uh, that this has taken place. Now, there used to be a time we wouldn't have thought about that. Isn't that right? And so what I'm saying is this. We've got to stand for something, number one. We've got to be passionate, you know, for what we believe in, number two. And we've got to get excited about evangelism and let people know about the blessed gospel of Jesus Christ. The early church was passionate. Jesus was passionate. He handed down this same passion to his disciples. In Romans 10, uh, there's a passage that says, it's about uh, verse 1, uh, where Paul says, My heart's desire, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer for Israel 
is that they might be saved. Now, that's not nearly as powerful as his statement in Romans 9 and 3. Uh, listen to this one, where Paul says, I would be willing to be cursed myself if my kinsman, according to the flesh, would believe and obey the gospel. That's the substance of what he says. Now think about that. What do you think about that? Now I'm telling you something. I don't have that commitment. I have not reached that spiritual point. I mean, if a trumpet start blowing, I want to be in the line. What about you? You know, Wayne may be trying to get ahead of me or something. <laughs> like, I can just see myself trying to work in there, you know, a little bit. But now here's Paul who says essentially this. I'd be willing, this is what he's saying. I'd be willing to lose my soul if my kinsmen, according to the flesh, would believe in Jesus Christ. What do you think about that? Is that passion or not? You see, that's passion. And, and I'm just saying that until we get that same kind of passion, we're not going to be serious about reaching lost people. <clears throat> in Acts chapter 20, he says in verse 24, I count not my life dear to myself. I'm kind of fond of mine, aren't you? I mean, it's the only one I got. I count it very dear to myself. In Acts 21, uh, Paul and his companions uh, come down to Caesarea where Philip is, who had the daughters who prophesied. And at, he's on his way to Jerusalem. Agabus the prophet comes down from Judea, and Agabus, Agabus takes Paul's belt, and he binds himself with it, and he says, he makes this prophecy, the owner of this belt, if he goes to Jerusalem, will be so bound and cast into the hands of the Gentiles. And when the brethren heard that, they got to, you know, carrying on something terrible. They were weeping and, and, and just uh, crying and, and uh, begging Brother Paul, you know, not to go to Jerusalem. Now, what would be your response to that? I can imagine some of us might think, wow, you know, they're carrying on, you know, about us and... And, uh, you know, that, that might make some of us feel rather important. But here's what Brother Paul said in verse 13 of Acts 21. He said, brethren, listen to me now. Are you listening? It's going to ease up on you. He said, brethren, what do you mean weeping and breaking my heart? I'm ready not only to be bound at Jerusalem, but to die for the name of the Lord Jesus. You see, his point is this. He, he said, brethren, you're coming between me and my mission." It reminds me of what the Lord said to Peter. You remember one time when the Lord was talking about his impending death? And then Peter said, oh, no, Lord, not you. You won't die. And what did the Lord say? Get behind me, Satan. I often wondered, why did he call Peter the devil? I'll tell you exactly why. Because Peter was talking like the devil. You see, our Lord Jesus came to this world in order to die. To die for me and to die for you. And... To step between he and his mission, you know, would be to utilize the devil's strategy. Paul had passion. He had great passion. And brethren, I'm telling you today, we talk about things losing their value. We talk about, you know, what's a dollar worth today and all of that sort of thing. Let me tell you something. Are you listening to me? Souls are just as valuable today as they've always been. The Bible says, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever shall save his life for my sake shall lose it, and whosoever loses his life for my sake shall gain it. What is a man profited if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Souls are valuable. We've got to be passionate concerning the souls of men. Number three, I think that the early church was successful in evangelism because they had a sense of urgency about themselves. Now, here's my point. I think urgency uh, grows out of passion. Are you passionate about something? How do you determine if you're passionate about something? Let me tell you if you're passionate about something. If you're passionate about something, that's what you find yourself talking about, you know, when you meet someone and uh, you haven't known them very long. So it might be fishing. That's going to come up. It might be old cars. You know, that'll come up. Or it might be quilting. You know, that might come up, or it might be crocheting. You know, that's going to come up. And so we're passionate about that which we like to talk about. 
You're passionate about something when you lie awake at night and you can't go to sleep because it's on your mind. You know, you're excited about it. You're passionate about it. And so urgency grows out of passion. Let me try to illustrate it, if I might. Let's say that you are a collector of uh, certain kinds of uh, antiques. Let's say, um, 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 let's say that you collect cut glass, all right? I've got one piece of cut glass that was given to me. Let's say that you collect cut glass, and you have such a fine collection, but there's one piece you're missing. And so you talk to the various cut glass dealers and so forth, and you say, if you ever get this piece, let me know. Five years goes by. It's on a Saturday afternoon. You're cooking hamburgers. You get a phone call, and the person says, you know that piece of cut glass that's missing in your collection that you won't want? I got it in my store right now. It's within five miles of your house. I appreciate you calling, but I've, I've just got these burgers going, and, and um, I just can't leave them right now. If I get a chance next week, you know, I'll try to drop by. No, that's not what you'd do. You, you would leave. You wouldn't even say, Mama, I'm going to town. You wouldn't do that. You, you'd just let everything burn up. You, you wouldn't care. You see, you'd be, you'd be urgent. Why? Because you've got a passion. This thing that you love, this thing that you, do, you enjoy, this, this, uh, this hobby or this collection or whatever, you enjoy it. And so you have finally found, as it were, the pearl of great price, you see. And you want it. And so you're urgent about it. What I'm trying to say is that's the kind of attitude I think we've got to get if we're going to win souls for Christ. What do you think? Amen? Pretty weak, but I'll take it. I never had a boy. Ms. Life and I had three girls. But if I had had a boy, I would name him Caleb. If I had had two boys, I would have named them Joshua and Caleb. They're two of my favorite guys. Do you remember God has told Israel about the promised land? Remember that? He said, it's yours for the taking. Y'all can have it. And so they send spies out to spy out the land. 40 in number. And they come back and they give the report. And they say, boys, it's something. They said, it's just, it's just, it's, it's amazing. It flows with milk and honey and, and, you know, just, you know, like God told us about. As a matter of fact, they said, here's a cluster of grapes. It took two men to carry this back. We hadn't found anything like this in a Kroger anywhere. It's wonderful. And then they said things like this. But... Wow, there's that magic word of contrast. But we saw the giants, and we looked like grasshoppers in their eyes, and besides that, we started looking at each other, and we looked like grasshoppers in our own eyes. We can't take that land. Now, you talk about pouring cold water on a good idea, you know, from God. That's what they did. And listen to old brother Caleb. He stood right up after hearing all that negativity, and here's what he said, Numbers 13, 30. Let us go up at once and possess it. We're well able to do it. Now, that's the kind of man I like. He was passionate. He said, God has promised us this land. It's ours for the taking. Let's go get it. That's passion, and that's urgency, you see, that's coupled with that. I think that we've got to have that. Speaking of an earthly king, David said in 1 Samuel 21, 8, but I think it's applicable in the sense that I wish to use it. But David said, the king's business requires haste. The king's business requires haste. You see, we attach importance to the business of of those in in, uh, important positions, you know, maybe political positions. And so they're a governor, they are a um, mayor, they're over the chamber of commerce, they're a senator, they're a congressman, they're a president, they're a king. We attach importance to that. The king's business requires haste. Imagine if you were to be invited by the, by the president of the United States. Suppose you got a phone call and the phone call says, we're honoring uh, citizens 
uh, who have made an impact in their community and has come to our attention that you've done X, Y, and Z. And so we want to honor you next week. We want you to come up here. We'll pay all your expenses. And um, we're going to have a big dinner in your honor. You know, give you an honorarium, give you a plaque, and so forth and so on, let you meet the president and, and, and so forth. Well, I don't know. I didn't vote for that fellow. I don't think I'm going to go. No, you'd go. Most people would, I think. No matter what your political affiliation is. Why? Because you attach importance to, you know, positions or people who occupy such positions. Maybe you wouldn't. But here's my point. We think that King's business is important. If you don't believe that, just listen to the news sometimes when they talk about... Um, uh, England, isn't the princess over there, you know, about to have another child? Am I right about that? And that's all the talk. All everybody's talking. I mean, they're they're standing out on the street waiting. You <laughs> know, they're carrying flags. You know, I, I mean, that's just incomprehensible to me. They think that's important, and it is important. Of course, it is. I mean, the birth of a of a new child. I mean, that's that's just absolutely incredible. But you know, I don't see myself getting on a plane and going over there and waiting. Do you? I mean, I've been to England, you know, before, but I, I don't anticipate doing that. But there are people that have come from all over the country because they think that's important. They attach importance to that business. Well, I'm telling you this. We are children of the heavenly king. Don't you believe that? Yes, you do. I know you do. We're children of the heavenly king. And his business is important. And let me tell you what his business is. His business is saving souls. That's his business. Saving souls. And we're the children of the king, and our business is to save souls. Number four, the early church <clears throat> believed that every person, watch it now, every person was a candidate for the gospel of Christ. They took seriously what the Lord said in Mark 16, go into all the world and what? Preach the gospel to every creature. Wayne, did you look, do like me when I first started preaching? I'd go out in the backyard, and I was, I was born and raised in the country. And, um, I mean, you didn't have to go to the woods, you know, to find squirrels and rabbits and such. They were like right there, you know. And I just preached up a storm, you know, to squirrels and rabbits. And we had an old cow, and, and you know, I talked to her a good bit, and, and, uh, but that's not the kind of creatures the Bible's talking about, is it? Of course not. Human beings go into all the world and preach the gospel to every human being. And that commission is, report, is reported in Matthew 28 and Luke 24 and 2 Timothy 2, 2 and, and so forth. And so it is taught in precept that every person's a candidate for the gospel. But watch this. It's taught in example. You may not be aware of this when you read John 4. But in John 4, Jesus goes to Samaria. Now, here's the way the Jews went to Samaria if they were down south. They would cross over the Jordan to the east. Then they'd go up the side of the Jordan and bypass Samaria. And when they got past Samaria, they'd cross back over the Jordan. What do you think about that? They weren't going to go through Samaria. Why? We're not going to go through that you know, pl place, a bunch of heathens, you know, a bunch of mixed um, uh, breeds and so forth. We're not going to do that. But watch this. When Jesus got ready to go to Samaria, what did he do? He went right through it, didn't he? Well, you talk about making mistakes as far as, you know, the thinking of the times. He went through Samaria. He wasn't supposed to do that. He stopped at a well being wearied, and he talked to a woman. He wasn't supposed to do that. Number three, he talked to a Samaritan woman. Number four, he asked that woman for a drink. What was he going to drink out of? Did he, have a cup at, did he have a cup back here in his hip pocket? No. You know what he was asking? He was saying, would you give me water from your dipper? I will put my mouth on your utensil. Give me something to drink. The Jews believed you could not use the dishes of Samaritans. You could not use their utensils. You would be unclean. But you see, our Lord Jesus came into the world to do what? 
to save people. What people? All people. What kind of people? All kinds of people. That's what our Lord came to do. Yeah, how important that is. And it's taught elsewhere. They that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. We find, in, that's Acts 8 and 4. We find in Acts 8 that Philip is preaching the gospel to the uh, Ethiopian. And so all people are candidates for the gospel of Christ. And so here's what I want you to do. The next time you're talking to someone and you're eyeball to eyeball with them, I want you to do this for me, okay? I want you to listen to what they're saying. But as you're making eye contact with them, I want you to say to yourself, here is a person who is in the image of God who is going to spend eternity with God and Christ and the Holy Spirit and the redeemed of all the ages or who's going to spend eternity with the devil and his angels. Because that, that's the only two alternatives. Is that right? All accountable people are either going to spend eternity with God or they're going to spend eternity with the devil. So the next time you're talking to someone, they're talking to you. When you make that eye contact, let that thought enter your mind. Here is a person who is in the image of God who's going to spend eternity either with God or with the devil. That's why we've got to look at people. Not as red or yellow or black or white or rich or poor or cultured or uncultured or um, educated or un uneducated or whatever classification you might come up with. But as human beings in the image of God. And every person, every person in this room is going to spend eternity either with God or with the devil. That's what the Bible teaches. Furthermore, the early church believed that every person could do something. We talked about that this morning in our Bible class, and so I won't expand that, except to emphasize for those perhaps who missed uh, this. Every person has a talent. Now, uh, some of us um, have deep buckets. I taught at Freed Hardeman for, in the classroom there for over 20 years and worked with the school for 25 years. And I associated with some people who had some deep buckets. I used to think that if I could just hang around them long enough, my bucket would get a little deeper. <laughs> it didn't work that way, you know. I mean, I didn't get smarter by osmosis or anything, you know, from them. I just didn't get smart, period. But at any rate, here's my point. Everybody is talented. Everybody has a talent. Everybody can do something. And as Paul said in the book of Romans, let us use those abilities, you know, that we have. It's not a head problem, it's whether we're using, it's a practical problem, it's whether we're using the abilities that we do have. So every person can do something. And then I want to leave us with this thought. If we would be successful at evangelism, if we would reach lost people, we would have a positive attitude. I want to go back to old brother Caleb. Here he has listened to all this negativity, and the first words out of his mouth are these words. Let us go get it, boys. <laughs> Let us go up at once and possess it. Now, it takes a person who has quite a bit of character, you know, to rise above all of that negative talk, you know, to come out with such a positive statement. But that's exactly what he did. And then I'm reminded of other verses like Philippians 4, 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Or Romans 8, we're more than conquerors. All of those passages are, are very encouraging passages. Or uh, Galatians 6 and 9, Be not weary in well-doing, for in due season we will reap. And so we've got to be positive people. Now let me say this quickly. I think some people are, are more naturally positive than others. You may or may not agree with that. I did a master's degree in counseling. I think I'm the only person who ever did a uh, did a whole master's in counseling and does not counsel. Um, there's a, more to that story, but that's all I'm inclined to share at this point in time. Uh, it's, it's not my talent. 
But in the course of that study, we had to take all these uh, various tests. What, what are Myers Briggs and California? What it, was it psychological inventory? This goes back to the early 90s. I can't remember all the details. And so one night, my professor comes in and he says, So, Dr. Light, I'd already graduated from the University of Tennessee. So, Dr. Light, melancholic, huh? Look it up. Sad, depressed, not very encouraging. <laughs> so it's not just my natural disposition to be a happy guy, apparently. And I'm also of the disposition that I can be easily pulled down, uh, be pulled down by people who are very negative. And so you know what I've learned? If I don't have it naturally, then I'm going to find those people who are naturally positive people, and I'm going to hang around them. What do you think? And guess what? It works. And I quit hanging around the naysayers. I quit hanging around the people that were doomsday. I quit hanging around the people who, you know, 20-something years ago or whatever said, oh, boy, I'll never, you know, get Social Security, or I'll never this, or, or uh, whatever. You know, you fill in the blank. I mean, there are people all around us like that, constantly, you know, feeding us this negative information. Well, here's my thought. Quit hanging around those folks. Because if you're like me, they pull you down. And I don't want to be pulled down, do you? I want to be someone who's encouraged. I want to be an encouragement to other people. I want to be a person uh, who sets an example, you know, such that people can say, wow, I want what that guy's got. I want the happiness that he enjoys. I want the life, you know, that he and his family are living. I want that. Shouldn't we be people like that? Yeah. We're lights in a crooked and perverse generation. God help us to be people who have positive attitudes. That'll go a long way in reaching lost people. So what can we do? First of all, let us stand for something. Number two, let us have passion. Number three, let us be urgent in our business. Number four, let us believe that every person is a candidate for the gospel of Christ. Number five, let us uh, believe strongly that every person can do something. And finally, God help us to be positive people. We can win souls. We can do it if we want to. I know that we can. Now, I'm wondering tonight, is there one or more souls here who never have confessed the name of Christ, who have not uh, repented of their sins and been baptized, you know, for forgiveness of sins? I'm wondering if, if we have one or more here like that tonight. And, um, and what I want you to hear me say is this. If you have not obeyed the gospel of Christ, I would say or do any righteous thing that I could say or do to encourage you to make that decision this evening. It won't be a more important decision in your life than that decision. And if you've made that decision and you haven't been the person that you need to be, perhaps it's, it's out of God's providence that you're here tonight. You had not planned to be here, but you're here. Won't you make that decision to come back to the Lord tonight? There are good folks here. One of the things that I enjoy in meeting so many people is, is, is meeting good people. And I'm convinced there are good people everywhere, and you are among good people. And these people will embrace you. They will hug you. They will forgive you. They will pray for you if you will make your request known. Is there something we can do for you tonight? Would you not let us do so as we stand and as we sing?